Good afternoon, welcome back to part four of our series of video lessons on Othello Act 1, Scene 3. And we are focusing on Iago's duplicity and his psychological manipulation of poor old Rodrigo uh, pictured on your screens. Uh, just to remind you of what's taken place in the play where we left off, uh, Othello has been charged with leading the Venetian fleet to Cyprus to defend that uh, Venetian territory from the encroaching Ottoman army and he has explained his relationship with Desdemona, he's explained how Desdemona fell in love with him and Des Desdemona has uh, verified his testimony and pleaded with the Duke to allow her, allow him to, allow her rather to travel with her husband to Cyprus to be alongside him. Um, and they've just exited the stage when this scene that we're looking at today takes place it goes without saying that really throughout the play Iago serves as a metaphorical puppet master uh, and Rodrigo is the poor manipulated puppet. Um, Rodrigo believes that Iago has his best interests at heart. Of course it was Iago who in Act 1, Scene 1 persuaded Rodrigo to awaken Brabantio and inform Brabantio about his daughter's elopement with Othello. It's Iago and Rodrigo who poisoned the mind of Brabantio uh, by describing uh, Othello as being a lecherous uh, half-man, half-beast, really, a lascivious character who has no control of his sexual desires. So they are culpable for stirring Brabantio into action, spurring him towards uh, into uh, trying to win his daughter back uh, through legal action and we saw the consequence of that in the last tutorial. In today's lesson we're going to be looking at a at the end of the scene um, we're going to be looking at the exchange that takes place between uh, Iago and Rodrigo and we're going to be looking at uh, how Iago manages to psychologically manipulate poor old Rodrigo uh, and we're going to be looking at his duplicity his Machiavellian nature and looking at how he uses his power of language, which is one of the key themes in the play, to persuade his foolish friend uh, to pursue Desdemona despite the fact that she is no longer available. Uh, so we'll start with our close reading. Okay, so. A fellow and Desdemona exit the stage, and of course Rodrigo uh, seeks comfort from Iago, having seen the plan that they con they conspired together uh, fail. The plan, just to remind you, was that they would persuade the Duke to uh, annul the marriage of a fellow and Desdemona, and of course Rodrigo is. Uh, pining after Desdemona and uh, has failed in his in his plot. He threatens to kill himself. He says, I will incontinently drown myself. Uh, and we have this kind of almost almost humorous scene in which Iago convinces him not to do so. Uh, he says, if you do, I'll never love you again. Uh, Rodrigo says, it's silliness to live when to live is torment. And then we have his prescription to die when death is our physician. So this idea that his... It, almost, he's speaking in cliche here as the kind of suicide or unrequited lover. Death, it, it, in this metaphor, it becomes a doctor who prescribes uh, death to Rodrigo because he's got nothing left to live for. And we, I would imagine in this kind of hyperbolic, hyperbolic use of language, uh, the audience might find this slightly comical. Iago responds by saying, Oh, villainous, I've looked upon the world for four times seven years, and since I could distinguish betwixt a benefit and an injury, I never found a man that knew how to love himself. Ere I would say I would drown myself for the love of a guinea hen, I would change my humanity with a baboon." And he's kind of mocking and goading uh, Rodrigo for, uh, for his suicidal thoughts, and he's ridiculing him for being over the top and overly melodramatic. Um, he says Interestingly, before I would drown myself for the love of a guinea hen, uh, I would change my humanity with a baboon. And he chooses two animals that might have derogatory connotations. Um, guinea, guinea hen was slang for a prostitute. Uh, so presumably he's being derogatory about Desdemona. He's, he often does this throughout the play. He often degrades 
Desdemona for her sexuality, for her femininity. He often describes in degrading terms. And likewise with Othello, he often degrades Othello by describing him using racial epithets. So we have this description of a guinea hen, as I said, slang for a prostitute. This idea that uh, Iago would be killing himself for the love of a whore, uh, is what he means here. And before he would do that, he says, I would change my humanity with baboon. Uh, baboon is an ape that was perceived as being rather uh, savage, rather uh, uh, lecherous, um, and of course rather ridiculous with the red behind. And perhaps this is a reference to Africa and perhaps to Othello. So I, I, I'm saying perhaps these could be interpreted as being uh, kind of derogatory uh, insults. Uh, to describe the central lovers of the play. Rodrigo then says, What shall I do? I confess it is a shame to be so fond, but it is not in my virtue to amend it. And then, essentially, Iago riffs on this idea of virtue. He says, Virtue. Uh, it's in ourselves that we are thus and thus. So we can control, we can decide how we ought to be. Uh, it's... it's it's up to us what we are. It's an interesting kind of uh, revelation, I suppose. It reveals something about his uh, Machiavellian thought process. Uh, we can decide what we want to be. Uh, so it's this, this idea that we have agency. And it's interesting that Iago you know, emphasises the idea that we have agency because, of course, he deliberately... And he'll, we'll look at this later in the lesson. He deliberately sets out step by step how he would choose to destroy Othello uh, and to sabotage his marriage. And he does so without expressing any remorse whatsoever. He's in completely, uh, he does it in a way that's completely unfeeling, completely amoral. And he tries to shake Rodrigo into action, tries to persuade him into persisting in his pursuit of Desdemona. Uh, he uses an extended metaphor here. Um, and he says, Our bodies are our gardens to the which our wills are gardeners. Uh, so that if we will plant nettles or sow lettuce, set hyssop and weed up, weed up thyme, supply it with one gender of herbs or distract it with many, either to have it sterile with idleness or manured with industry, why the power and corrigible authority of this lies in our wills. And what he means by this metaphor of um, the body being a garden and will or the willpower being the gardener is that individuals can choose what they, what they do. They can choose what they plant. And by so doing, they can choose in what state the garden ends up. Will it be barren? Will it be full of life? Will it be a herb garden? Will it be full of weeds? Uh, he's saying we can choose how our garden is arranged. Will it be abundant? Will it be uh, productive? Will it be manured with industry? Or will it be sterile? So he, he offers these, this juxtaposition of a, of a barren and idle garden or a garden full of industry. And he says the choice lies in us, lies in willpower, lies in uh, our will, not in our virtues. So the power and the corrigible authority of this lies in our wills. We have uh, the ability to decide whether or not to make the most of our bodies in this metaphor. Um, he talks later about how without the power of will, without reason, uh, we would end up succumbing to our basic instincts, succumbing to our base desires, succumbing to our uh, passions. He says, uh, if the beam of our lives had not one scale of reason to poison other of sensuality, the blood and basis of our natures would conduct us to most preposterous conclusions. So essentially, if he's saying, if we didn't have rationality uh, to control our passions, and I'll put that to rationality in, in mind here is on top of the passions. If we, if we didn't have rationality to overcome and subdue and control the passions, our lives would uh, be forfeit and our lives would, we would end up making decisions that would be ridiculous, preposterous. Uh, we would end up in situations that were uh, regrettable and it's, it's thanks to our rationality that we don't end up 
uh, merely falling victim to our passions. So it's an interesting, I suppose, an enlightened way of thinking uh, from Iago. He's, he, he praises uh, reason over, over man's other faculties. I think it's quite interesting that he is, in a sense, a modern, uh, enlightened man in this sense. However, of course, he is uh, someone who is who, who clearly has a, a, a cold and sociopathic ability to repress any feelings of guilt, any feelings of regret in, him, in himself. And of course, we have to remember that he's, his, his language is very insidious and pernicious because, of course, th these words are designed to convince uh, Rodrigo. We don't know whether or not Iago actually believes these words to be true. So again, he... he compares reason to a, to a balm or, or something that kind of cools, cools one down. He says, we have reason to cool our raging uh, motions, our carnal stings, our unbittered lusts. And here's the kind of crux of his argument here. He talks about carnal stings. He talks about unbittered lusts. And these are the passions he's referring to earlier. He's he says, were it not for reason, our raging lusts, our raging carnal desires, the kind of animalistic parts of our mind, the um, more lecherous uh, emotions, were it not for reason, these feelings would be unbridled. They would, be, uh, they would, they would over overwhelm us. And it's reason that cools us down, reason that makes us more... Uh, human in a sense because we're able to repress those uh, lustful, carnal, animalistic appetites. And then we come to the end of his argument. He says, whereof I take it this thing that you call love to be a sect or a, or, or a scion. And what he means here is that really love is just a cutting off. Uh, well, that's what he means here. Uh, it's, just, it's just a, cut, a cutting off. It's just an, an offshoot in a sense, of, of lust. So it, it expresses a very cynical uh, view of love. For Iago, love is merely lust in, dressed up in a more um, respectable costume. It's, it's something that is really uh, a facade that masks the animalistic carnal urges of lust. Um, so again, we get the sense of Iago being rather cynical in his attitude towards love as he comes to the conclusion of this extended metaphor. Love is merely an offshoot, merely a cutting, uh, go back, going back to that gardening metaphor. Interesting that that's his perception, but again remember that his language is very slippery, that he's saying these, he's saying these things to deliberately manipulate uh, Rodrigo, to persuade Rodrigo to uh, to not give up, to carry on his pursuit of Desdemona, which of course uh, is not because he wants Rodrigo to to, to succeed. He, he, he has no interest in that. He's using Rodrigo as a pawn and, and, and a pawn and a puppet to get his own way. So he's using Rodrigo for his own ends. It's, it's not out of friendship. Rodrigo, it cannot be that love is merely lust uh, by a different name. Iago responds, it is merely a lust of the blood and a permission of the will. Um, so again, he reinforces and reiterates these cynical uh, ideas about love being merely uh, a construct, that, uh, a different name for our carnal desires. Uh, he then, again, tries to invigorate Rodrigo, come be a man, drown myself, drown cats and puppies. Um, what he means here is not, he's, he's, lots of my students have thought, have interpreted this as him instructing Rodrigo to go out, to go out and drown cats and puppies. What he means is that cats and puppies are things that ought to be drowned, uh, not men. Because it goes back to that previous exclamatory sentence here. When he says, come be a man, uh, he's uh, belittling and, and mocking uh, Rodrigo for being effeminate and for contemplating such a thing as suicide, which was perceived uh, to be... Um, obviously a mortal sin, but also perceived to be womanish in a sense. Drown myself, drown cats and puppies. Uh, he says, you'll never need me more as a friend than now. I'm not going to go into too much detail in the next few lines, but essentially he's offering him 
friendship at the most important time. Then we have the fascinating uh, line that is repeated over and over and over and over again in this speech, and it's put money in thy purse. Uh, it's both a way of kind of incentivizing Rodrigo, but also uh, spurring him on. It's a way of uh, spurring him towards pursuing Desdemona. A way, uh, uh, and of course, we know that he's actually intending on manipulating Rodrigo. When he's urging him to put money in his purse, we know that he's not to be trusted and that uh, presumably the money that Rodrigo puts in his purse, Iago will be the beneficiary of that. He'll, he will take Rodrigo's money. He instructs him to put money in thy purse. What he means by this is to raise capital, raise, uh, raise money. And he could raise money here, Rodrigo could raise money by mortgaging his estate, by selling some possessions, by selling his land. So he's urging him on to sell his money so that when he, so when the time is right, uh, when Othello and Desdemona's marriage has fallen apart, he can present himself as a worthy suitor. But that image of money being put in the purse is, uh, is, is repeated throughout the speech, and we'll talk about why, how it becomes an important uh, metaphor or an important instruction, but also it, we can talk about how it remains ironic throughout, because, of course, uh, a purse has purse strings, and the person who operates the purse strings in this is, of course, Iago. He's the one who uh, is manipulating Rodrigo, although that is unbeknownst to Rodrigo. He instructs him further. He says, follow thou the wars, defeat thy favour with, uh, with a usurped beard. Uh, what he means is uh, follow the Venetians to the war. So go to Cyprus, go on and take on the Ottomans and defeat thy favour with an, a usurped beard. Is a comical way of saying, uh, grow a false beard which would suit you as a soldier uh, and mask the fact that you're actually... Uh, a a well-to-do young gentleman, you're not so mask your lack of soldiership with this uh, usurped beard. So he's telling, he's set, saying, pursue them, pursue them, uh, go to the wards, go to Cyprus, uh, grow a beard to disguise your identity. He says again, put money in thy purse. And it becomes an incredibly sinister phrase, an incredibly sinister uh, maxim that Iago repeats time and time again and we just get the impression that he, yes he's urging his friend on but also there's a sinister implication that he himself will be the beneficiary, he, he himself will uh, defraud his own friend. He says then it cannot be long that Desdemona should continue to love her more, put money in the purse uh, nor heed his to her. And he prophesizes the collapse of their marriage. He prophesizes future ruin. He says, well, I don't think it'll be very long that Desdemona can continue to love the Moor. Notice how he, Othello is still just the Moor to Iago. He's still defined by his um, blackness and by his uh, race. Put money in thy purse, he repeats again. Um, thinking about why it can't be long that Desdemona should continue her love to the Moor. Think about the use of that phrase guinea hen earlier on. Think about how uh, Iago constantly refers to Desdemona in this um, derogatory and rather degrading way. He, uh, he really presents her as being this um, overtly monstrously sexualized figure when of course that's completely the opposite of the, of the character that we've been introduced to. Um, and there's an implication which we'll talk about later that uh, it's because of her sexual drive uh, because of her insatiable sexual appetites that the more won't be able to satisfy her. So he constantly speaks about women, men, uh, Othello in degrading terms and sneering contemptuous terms. It was a violent commencement in her, he says, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration, uh, sequestration sorry, but put by money in thy purse. It's interesting that he he describes Desdemona's falling in love with Othello as being a violent commencement. Thinking back to the gardening uh, extended metaphor from a moment ago when he talks about, you know, 
human willpower and how we can choose what we are, he describes Desdemona as someone whose passions have out, have kind of uh, violently uh, taken over her. So again, we have the sense that she is um, overtly sexualized. She's overt. She has these overtly uh, sexual a- appetites that are, in some in some senses, unnatural. Uh, there's a violent commencement. And again, she's defined by her sexuality in the same way that Othello is defined by his race uh, when Iago refers to either of them. And again, he, he says, you'll see a violent uh, response. You'll see a correspondingly violent separation. And again, this is a great example of foreshadowing in the same way of Brabantio's parting lines, you know, look to, the, look to her more. Uh, she's deceived her father, she may deceive thee. Very similar here, that this idea of an un- unanswerable uh, sequestration is something that we'll see later on when, of course, their marriage does violently come to an end uh, in, the, in the bedchamber, in the very, on the very bed itself, uh, with the murder of Desdemona by her husband. And, again, thinking about the tone, another sinister repetition of put thy money in thy purse. He then generalises about uh, Moors, and he generalises about uh, Africans, and tries to present himself as being uh, well-travelled, as though he's met many Moors in his past. Uh, He says, the Moors are changeable in their wills. And he speaks in a generalised fashion, I'll put generalised, Uh, and in a sweeping fashion about an entire people. Uh, He's conjuring this stereotype of Africans being um, rather capricious. They they have these mood swings. They're not stable. They're they're irrational. Uh, And it's a sweeping generalization about, uh, as I said, a vast number of people. And yet another example, sorry, I'll zoom out there, Yet another example of uh, Iago relying on racial st- stereotypes and, and crafting these racial stereotypes uh, in the play. He then repeats his command, his insidious uh, and, si- and sinister command, fill thy purse with money. Prepare yourself to be a suitor. Prepare yourself to uh, have the money in order to... Uh, win over Desdemona once that marriage has come to an end. So once again we see Iago's rather uh, ins- race, racially charged, and, uh, to say the least, attitudes permeating through throughout the play again. This idea that the Moors aren't, are inconstant, that they are capricious, that they seem to lack the rationality that he was referring to earlier on. I think he does give voice to uh, the s- racial theories and racial stereotypes held by Venetian society at the time. I think he is that mouthpiece for those racist ideas. He then continues with a more insulting and derogatory uh, metaphor. I'll just put M for metaphor. The food that to him now is as luscious as locusts shall to him shortly as acerb as coloquintida. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. That's a type of apple. Um, the food that to him now, so the food here in the metaphor, again, this is really Iago kind of craft, in a kind of crass and crude way, talking about base desires, talking about sexual desires, uh, and in this sense, it's just another appetite for Othello, who's presented as almost animalistic, in that he, ha- he has these base desires that he has to gratify and fulfil. So this again reminds us of his... Um, graphic descriptions of Othello as a, as a horse and as a, as a black ram from early on in the play. This idea that he has these animalistic desires, that he's, uh, overwhelming, he's overwhelmed by his sexual passions, that he's this aggressive, forceful, hyper-masculine figure. Um, and almost subhuman in a sense, he lacks the rationality that we talked about earlier. So the food that to him now is as luscious as locusts, uh, there's that kind of insidious and sinister use of alliteration there, as luscious as locusts. It, it kind of presents his disgust at Othello, and perhaps as a reference to the 
to the dietary uh, arrangements of you know of you know, locusts are a, are a delicacy in some African countries. So it's again a, perhaps an insult about the cuisine and the diets of African people of Moors. Um, to the so, so what he means here is that the food that is currently as luscious as locusts shall to him shortly be as acerb as this type of ap apple. So he's saying the food that he currently enjoys will soon taste bitter, soon taste revolting. And of course the food is Desdemona and his, uh, and his sexual desires for Desdemona. Um, so he speaks about the pair of them in this incredibly derogatory uh, and de incredibly incendiary way. So once again, he's presenting Othello in this incredibly derogatory fashion, as we've just said. He predicts that she will tire of him as well. So not only will he, he will tire of her because he will, uh, he will essentially gorge himself. And of course, metaphorically, that's the metaphorically, but literally he, he exhausts himself sexually. That's what I think Iago is implying here. And she will tire of him uh, according to Iago, he says, she must change for youth. That's fairly straightforward. Uh, he reiterates this idea, which we've heard before, which Othello actually brought up as well, of the age gap between them. That she will, uh, she will change him for youth. And we can already start to predict why Iago believes that she will want to exchange Othello for a younger man, based on how uh, fixated his mind is on on lust, on sex, on um, the act of copulation, we know that he's probably referring to the fact that she has more sexual energy, she has a stronger sex drive, she's even more lecherous than he is. So once again, not only is Othello unnatural because of his insatiable appetite for sex, so too is Desdemona, they're both equally uh, ravenous in that regard. So she's going to change for a younger man. Uh, who can, who can satisfy her, we can predict that already, and let's see if, see if that's right. He says, when she is sated with his body, uh, well, there you go, when she is sated with his body, she will find the errors of her choice. And this idea, again, we've got these words, again, belonging to the same lexical field that all relate to hunger and food and the appetites. And here, the word sated is, is in relation to her sexual desires, her sexual appetites. She'll be sated eventually with his body uh, because his body will presumably tire and give out. And again, she's presented as this, as being incredibly voluptuous, incredibly lecherous, incredibly uh, sexualized by Iago, again, in, a, in, a, in order to degrade her, in order to uh, essentially describe his disgust in her behavior. And he, he emphasizes the point, she will find errors of her choices, she'll realize she made a mistake in choosing the old man and choosing Othello because he doesn't have the energy, the implication being he doesn't have the sexual energy to satisfy her. Uh, she must have changed, she must. And again, this cynical and sinister repetition of that phrase, she must, she must have changed. And once again, we hear the repetition, therefore, put money in thy purse, prepare yourself. If you will damn yourself, he says, do it a more delicate way than drowning. Make all the money you can. So if you're going to damn yourself, if you're going to commit, a, and remember going back to um, suicide, that was seen as a, as a mortal sin. So when, when Iago says, if you're going to damn yourself, he means if you're going to damn yourself, Anyway, because that's what Iago, that's what Rodrigo would have done had he committed suicide. Iago is saying, if you're going to damn yourself, you might as well do it by trying to make all the money you can. Uh, so you might you might as well do it and go out in glory, I guess, in a blaze of glory. Iago continues, um, if sanctimony and a frail vow betwixt an erring barbarian and a super subtle Venetian be not hard for my wits and all the tribe of hell, thou shalt enjoy her and therefore make money. So what he means here by the sanctimony of a frail vow, uh, sanctimony being uh, the idea of a holy life, a, a holy um, union. A frail vow, uh, the vow of course is the vow of marriage and it's a bit of an oxymoron because of course that vow is supposed to be uh, a very strong vow, a very powerful vow, a vow that 
uh, a promise that is supposed to last for a lifetime. But in, in Iago's mind, in Iago's language, uh, this vow that they have made to, towards one another uh, is frail, it's fragile, it can be easily broken. So he's already anticipating the disruption and the destruction of their marriage. So the frail vow between an erring barbarian and a super subtle Venetian. Um, again, we have the racially charged language to describe a fellow. Let's talk about that first. Um, we've seen this word before, to err is to wonder. So it's, this is the word reiterating the, um, I suppose, the otherness and the alien nature of a fellow, the fact that he's an outsider, the fact that he is uh, a wanderer, he's a traveller. And then, of course, the word barbarian is incredibly charged. Uh, barbarians uh, are, well, we, know, we know, presumably know what it means. It's someone who's considered to be uncivilized, someone who's considered to be uh, a savage. And the fact that he is rendered as a savage, despite the, the, fact, that he's, the fact that Iago insults him as being uncivilized, again, is partly to do with his race and his complexion, and partly to do with the fact that as a Moor, he is uh, from the desert. And we think about barbar barbarians and Barbar and Ali Barbar from the 1001 1, Nights. So there's an Arabic connotation as well. Um, so again, it's a racial slur. And it d demeans Othello. And of course, we've, we know that Othello is a wise, noble, virtuous, uh, loyal citizen, a loyal, um, a loyal servant of the Venetian state. He's not... Uh, a, a mere barbarian. He has earned his place in um, Venetian society. Next, let's look at the derogatory slur uh, for Desdemona. Desdemona, according to Iago, is super subtle. And what he means by this is, again, uh, he's playing on her sexuality, he's playing on her femininity, and he's suggesting that uh, as she's subtle, she's cunning. So again, he reiterates what he said earlier about her being a guinea fowl. So again you might again you might say she, he is insinuating that she is uh, like a prostitute and this is I suppose supported by the fact that just like um, Othello is usually referred to as the Moor, she now becomes the Venetian and, and Venice uh, was well known for its courtesans. Which we, so courtesans were the kind of uh, elite prostitutes and what Iago seems to be suggesting here, but he, remember he describes uh, Othello as a barbarian, is that Othello is defined by where he's from. He's his behaviour, his, uh, his um, savagery is based on the fact that he is an African, he's based on the fact that he's an outsider, he's not from Christendom, he's not European. So too, Iago seems to suggest, is Desdemona defined by where she's from, a place that is known for its uh, more liberal attitude towards sex, a, a place that's known for its uh, debauchery. And he seems to imply that because Desdemona is from Venice, a place known for its courtesans, uh, it's no surprise that she therefore acts in a way that is, in some senses, unnatural. She's not a typical uh, or archetypal image of femininity. And I think Iago keeps emphasising this idea of uh, her having these depraved sexual appetites. So, going back to this, he says, um, it, can't, it can't be too hard for my wits and all the tribe of hell uh, for you to destroy this holy union, essential, for us to destroy this holy, holy union and to, tear, and to tear apart the marriage between Desdemona and Iago. And he summons both his wits, so his intelligence and his Machiavellian nature, but also the tribe of hell, and he very much, uh, you know, he very much allies himself with the devil, and he'll, he'll do that even more so later on in the speech. But he allies himself with hell. He knows that his uh, intentions are malevolent and evil. He is completely uh, clear-sighted in the fact that what he's going to set out to do is utterly immoral, and yet he does it anyway. So he, he has all the hallmarks of a kind of sociopath in that sense, all the hallmarks of a Machiavellian villain. Um, very similar, actually, to the opening soliloquy of Richard III, if you've read that, uh, where he, uh, and throughout, in fact, throughout Richard III, Richard III uh, allies himself with the devil and compares himself to the devil as well. 
in a, in a, in a, with a sense of pride. Um, so he says, with, uh, with my wits, with the tribe of hell, you shall enjoy her. And he can't help, remember this is the Argo, he cannot help but end on, a, a, I suppose, a pun uh, and on an example of innuendo. Because what he means by enjoy is, of course, to sleep with. Um, and it's not a surprise that once again he degrades Desdemona. Uh, he focuses entirely on her femininity, on her sexuality. Therefore, he reminds and, re and urges once again, Rodrigo, therefore make money. A pox on drowning, it is a clean way out of that. Seek thou rather to be hanged, uh, compassing thy joy than to be drowned and go without her. So he says, you know, why not, get your, why not, hang, why not be hanged rather than drown yourself in the pursuit of something that you want? Um, Rodrigo's nearly convinced, says or asks, wilt thou be fast to my hopes if I depend on the issue? And uh, Iago promises him his support and says, you're sure of me and now go make money. I have told thee often, I tell thee again, I hate them more. Um, which he has mentioned before. And what's one of, the, one of the most fascinating things about Iago, one of the most fascinating um, aspects of the entire play really, is the fact, and lots of critics have mentioned this, is the fact that he doesn't really seem to have a reason for hating the Moor. He doesn't really seem to have any founded reason, any clear reason for his hatred of Othello. And he, he'll refer to many different possible reasons uh, throughout the play. He'll, he'll, he'll uh, say that, he's, that the Moor, that Othello slept with his wife. He'll say that he hates Othello because he was overlooked for his position in, uh, as his lieutenant. He'll say that he hates Othello because he himself loves the Desdemona. One of the fascinating things about um, Othello as a play is that he doesn't seem to have any motive. And we've talked about how he's often described as, uh, you know, the motiveless malignancy of Iago. I think it's the words that um, Coleridge used to describe him. He has a motiveless malignancy. He, he does these evil things for the sake of being evil, out of pure selfishness and pure uh, wickedness. My cause is hearted, which means he has a good reason for his cause, but ironically, he doesn't actually say what that reason is. He then says, If thou canst cuckold him, thou dost my, thyself a pleasure, me a sport. Uh, and what he means here is, if you can make a fellow into a cuckold, into a man whose wife has been, has been unfaithful to him, if you can cuckold a fellow, you've done yourself a pleasure, and of course that word pleasure is a double entendre, it has a double meaning, uh, because it's, it, of course, refers to the fact that it's, it's done him some good, but also he's, uh, sorry, you can't see, it's also a, a, a word that obviously describes sexual pleasures. So by cuckolding Othello, it would, it would require sleeping with Desdemona. It's done Iago a sport. And it's interesting that he uses that. Uh, it's as if he just is playing this game for the enjoyment of it. It's, again, another example of his Machiavellian nature that he seems to enjoy these games and stratagems he seems to derive great satisfaction from merely outsmarting others just for the sake of it he seems to derive pleasure from seeing uh, the downfall of others so once again we've seen that we've seen the duplicitous nature of Iago we've seen how he uses language to ensnare those around him to manipulate those around him. We've seen his attitudes about love, how he thinks love is merely uh, a carnal desire, merely lust dressed up with a different word. We've talked about how he is uh, someone who seems to be obsessed with degrading others, with belittling others um, through his use of language. In the next lesson, the final lesson on Act 1, Scene 3, we'll look at his soliloquy uh, once Rodrigo uh, exits the stage.